a great honor. In November 2009, newly elected U.S. President Barack Obama made his first state visit to China. Obama was looking to forge a new kind of partnership with Beijing. Instead, however, the Chinese treated him, in diplomatic terms, with a striking lack of respect. The New York Times' Edward Wong was one of the reporters covering the visit. During the uh, President Obama's trip in 2009, um, there was a lot of discussion of the controls that uh, the Chinese were exerting on um, what the White House wanted to do. Um, for example, Obama wanted to have an open discussion at one point with students, um, but the dialogue that eventually took place, sort of a town hall style meeting, was very stilted. He wasn't allowed to hold a press conference where there was uh, a Q&A afterwards, or, um, and so the Chinese exerted very tight control. Beijing's new assertiveness was rooted in a view that the global financial crisis, which began in 2008, had left the U.S. in decline, while China, which weathered the crisis with a huge stimulus program, was on the rise. Austin Ramsey, who'd studied Chinese in northeastern China, was now in Beijing for Time magazine. I think there was this, a real sense of, uh, you know, increased confidence, less concern about what the uh, rest of the world thinks on certain things, and uh, um, a sense that this was sort of China's time, that uh, the U.S. Is, is in decline, the West is in decline in general. After the collapse started in the U U.S., we started seeing and hearing lots of um, things being said in China about how the American system was broken, about how the capitalist system uh, that was being promoted in the West uh, couldn't work for other countries in the world and that would lead to um, dire consequences. And so China was saying that with its state capitalism, its sort of party-led version of the capitalist system, that, saying that this was the appropriate model for China and for the rest of the world. There's no question China's leaders were emboldened by the immense success of the country's economic boom. Michael Forsyth returned to Beijing earlier in 2009 for his second stint as a Bloomberg News correspondent covering the economy. I think the first year I was back, it was, it was amazing to me to see the incredible wealth that had been, been built up. In Shanghai, David Barboza was now in his fifth year as the New York Times China business reporter. It's the story, you know, and it is going to change everything for everyone. And everyone needs to think about what the rise of China means. For his first reporting trip, Forsyth went to Shijiazhuang, a drab, nondescript city 160 miles southwest of Beijing. He was astonished by what he saw. My first really memorable story then was uh, going to um, Hebei, to Shijiazhuang, uh, and uh, going to a Gucci store there and a Starbucks, you know, in Shijiazhuang, which was still quite a poor city. Figuring out how to explain to editors and readers and viewers the scale of the change, how the process worked, and what it meant for ordinary Chinese and for Americans became a central challenge for the U.S. press corps. For an organization like CNN and being an American organization, the obvious point of entry to the story was China versus the U.S. What does China's rise mean for the United States? How was the U.S. dealing with a potential rival the size of China? But for TV reporters like Grant and his colleague, Korean-American Eunice Yoon, conveying China's complex internal dynamic was a challenge. China is not a bang-bang story. It's not like a story in the Middle East where there's suddenly all these amazing events that are happening in front of you. In terms of the daily movement in China, the, the backstory, the nuance, the, the analysis of, of, of the, the change that was taking place, that was, that was increasingly difficult um, to, to try to sell there because they're looking for the big the Big Bang. They're looking for, for the, the, the spectacular. Rob Schmitz, who'd served in the Peace Corps in China in the 1990s with Peter Hessler, who later went on to write for The New Yorker, had become a correspondent in Shanghai for the radio business program Marketplace. He decided to use the street on which he lived, Changle, the street of eternal happiness, to illustrate how China was changing. Every month I, I reported a story uh, about someone on that street and it gave me more time to focus on who these people were, where were they in their lives, and how did they fit 
in China's economy and where did they see themselves uh, in China and, and, and where did they see their future? What were their dreams? What were their hopes and their hopes for their children? So I followed them around. I, I watched them work. These stories had time to breathe. And so it was a good departure from this 24-hour news cycle. And I think in many ways, these are the stories that get to the heart of the matter in China. Evan Osnos, who'd taken over from Peter Hessler as the New Yorker correspondent, was not under pressure to cover breaking news. So he too did articles about the neighborhood where he lived, specifically a stall outside his front gate in Beijing. And they sold biscuits. And I got to know the person who ran the little biscuit shop. And then it, overnight, the place shut down after just a couple of weeks. And I talked to the woman who was running it and asked her why, she sh why it was shutting down. And she explained some of the economic forces at play when you're a little shopkeeper in Beijing. And then it was replaced by a breakfast pancake shop, a jianbing shop. And so I then sort of got to know a little bit about the economics of that business. And then that place closed down. And then finally, there was a, uh, a brothel that moved in. And, and the brothel um, took over that same space that had been the biscuit shop. And I thought, OK, well, you know, the brothel, the brothel business is proven. That's probably going to have a future. And sure enough, actually, the brothel then shut down after a few days. And I was starting to think, like, what is wrong with this area? And then finally, a hardware store moved in that sold construction materials to the local construction crews. And that survived. And I decided, in fact, that may be the definition of a housing bubble, is when a hardware store lasts longer than a brothel in your neighborhood. Indeed, the construction boom became a feature of the Chinese landscape, fueled by huge amounts of state money pumped into the economy to minimize the impact of the global financial crisis. The resulting growth continued the process of lifting hundreds of millions out of poverty it also produced a new class of exceptionally wealthy Chinese, many with connections to the top leadership. Obviously, many, many people in the middle class were far better off, and China was also far better off than it was even six years ago. But the bling you saw on Beijing streets, you know, exceeded any bling you would ever see in even Los Angeles or London or New York. Almost a decade after his first China posting, Jeremy Page, who'd most recently been in Moscow, returned to Beijing for the Wall Street Journal. The issue that really sort of caught my eye the most was uh, this uh, question of princelings and their role in the in the party elite and the extent to which they dominated both political decision making and uh, economic decision making and, and were to a large extent sort of you know reaping, reaping the benefits. David Barboza began thinking about doing a series on the relationship between the government, big business and private entrepreneurs. The idea was to do you know five or six stories on state capitalism and end it with how the children of the leaders are involved in business. My hope was to, you know, find something new. You know, I wasn't sure w whether I'd find something really big. The boom, however, also produced an explosion of corruption, a growing gap between the rich and poor, the booming coast and the impoverished interior fueling social tensions, which also became a central theme of American reporting on China. There is a huge difference between Beijing, Shanghai, and the rest of China. And it is so impressive when you drive around Shanghai, you see the gleaming buildings, and you see the, the striving, stylish people. And, and to say, this is not, you know, it's, it's as if you're saying, New York, you know, the Upper West Side, is what is what the U.S. is. You, you know, you cannot make that kind of uh, assumption. Keith Richburg, who'd been in and out of China for years, became the Washington Post's Beijing correspondent in 2009. So I went down, for example, to Hainan Island, uh, where villagers were complaining about the same thing, all their land being taken, or traditional farmland and forest land being taken, and golf courses and hotel resorts being built because Chinese, uh, the Chinese government decided they wanted to turn Hainan Island into the Hawaii of, of China. And uh, it was absolutely fascinating to see how everybody knows about these issues there. They all can tell you the names of the developers. Uh, they can always tell you who the corrupt officials are. The gap between haves and have-nots was just one fault line in Chinese society. 
Another was between ethnic Han Chinese and the Muslim Uyghur population in the western province of Xinjiang. In the summer of 2009, the Uyghurs went on a bloody rampage in Xinjiang's capital, Urumqi. The immediate trigger was police efforts to quell a protest against mistreatment of Uyghurs in southern China. The broader issue was Uyghur resentment of the Han flooding into a region where they'd once been the majority. Nearly 200 people died. Close to 2,000 were injured. Edward Wong, whose father had served in the People's Liberation Army in Xinjiang when he was a child, had recently arrived in China after a stint covering the war in Iraq for the New York Times. The 2009 uh, riots in Urumqi were uh, another big story that also reminded me of my time in Iraq. Um, as soon as we got the first news of uh, large numbers of deaths, of civilian deaths in Urumqi, um, I got on a plane and flew out there. And, uh, and the situation there was as tense as anything I've reported on in China. In Xinjiang, this was a massacre of Han people by Uyghurs. It was not the Uyghurs being the victims, and the Uyghurs are traditionally the victims in international lives. So there was a story there that China wanted to tell. The result was that while the authorities cut phone and internet links from Xinjiang, they dealt with the press in a very different way than in previous cases of unrest in places like Tibet. Chris Buckley covered the troubles for Reuters. Now, the China's official position is that militancy and violence in, in, in Xinjiang is largely the product of uh, a religious extremism which has been imported from abroad. And I think very much at the time the government was trying to show uh, a foreign viewership in particular, television being so important, that that was what was happening in Xinjiang. And, uh, and, and you know, they gave their press conferences and, and, and put that account forward. Chinese-American Melissa Chan had been in Beijing for the English language service of Al Jazeera since 2007. We went to Urumqi and there was a hotel and even a press room with people from the foreign ministry and the local Waiban providing us internet, providing us information, offering to take us on, I don't, I don't know, tours or what, what, offering to take us around. And uh, we got there and that was a nice welcome mat and so we took them up on their offer and they took us to a heavily Uyghur neighborhood where some of the rioting had taken place. I think they miscalculated. I think that they uh, could take, thought they could take us there, we'd film and we'd be on our way. What happened is everything went off script. Suddenly the streets were filled with hundreds of protesting Uyghur women. They were shouting, uh, denouncing the party, denouncing the controls that the party had placed on Uyghurs. Um, and then the journalists, a group of journalists were interviewing them. We were standing in the street interviewing these women um, who had their uh, fists raised in the air. And they were marching towards uh, the Chinese military officers, uh, chanting. Some of them started picking up objects looking like they wanted to throw rocks. But the front lines were Uyghur women. So it was this contrast, right? It is just this people power moment. And they knew that international media were there. They absolutely knew it. And the whole thing went off script. This is not turning out the way they wanted. Lesson learned, never take foreign press around. Um, and I don't recall a time after where they would take us around in a condition like that. Indeed, from that point on, the Chinese authorities severely tightened controls in Xinjiang, including on access by the foreign press. But in the rest of China, reporters discovered surprising openness. There were a lot more academics and think tanks and, and former party officials and, and newspaper editors who we could go out and chat with who were willing to meet with us and talk and tell us some things going on. And I found that a uniquely, uh, 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 a, a uniquely open experience for China, which I always saw as this kind of closed place. And all of a sudden, you did have this kind of whole other uh, civil society, think tank, academic community out there that, were, that we could talk to, we could quote in our stories. Uh, it became a whole other source of information. It was also the high point of Weibo, the Chinese version of Twitter. It's almost impossible for me to imagine my experience as a reporter in China 
without having been there during this period of the internet. I, when I was a student in China, there were a million people online. And then by the time I left as a correspondent in 2013, there were half a billion people online. And so during that period, um, it had two powerful effects. One was on the people who we were writing about, who were suddenly finding themselves empowered in a way with this new technological potential. It put them in touch with each other. It helped them find other people who were like them out in the world. Um, and of course, it also gave them a new tool for registering their complaints and for participating in a kind of public sphere that hadn't existed before. And suddenly, the, the internet, and especially Weibo, I mean, you know, was like this sort of ginormous nationwide tip line where you could find these extraordinary stories and contacts and pictures and proof videos. So I, it was extremely important in, uh, in reporting. Social media is a great tool just because uh, people will all over the country post photos or talk about uh, different uh, issues that they're facing. And so um, obviously there's a lot of censorship that goes on, but there's a certain window when something happens and suddenly you'll see all these people talking about a subject and then retweeting. In 2011, a high-speed train crashed near the coastal city of Wenzhou. Dozens of passengers were killed and many more injured. I remember we first found out about that. My news assistant called me well before this ever appeared on any official news sites because she was finding it on her on her Weibo on Chinese Twitter. And the first reports about the Wenzhou train crash and the first uh, and the first pictures from inside the damaged train car came from people with cell phones who were posting it on Weibo. This was, in a lot of ways, the first national disaster that played out in real time on the internet because these were people who were connected. I mean, the people who could afford to be on this high-speed train were people with cell phones and with social media accounts and with entire identities um, that existed online. And so when their friends and their family and other people who were out there in China began to complain about how this how this crash had happened and what were the underlying causes? Was there corruption? Was the construction, uh, were the construction standards poor? Was the train built too fast? Those kinds of questions, instead of people registering them quietly around the dinner table or going down to the local town square and having a small demonstration, all of a sudden people were putting this stuff out on the internet. The technological revolution was also having another dramatic effect on the way foreign journalists operated. Whether print, radio, TV, or a wire service, the demand from editors now was to service multiple platforms all the time. It did increase the workload massively. Uh, suddenly we were having to, to, um, to do wires for CNN, uh, write feature stories for the CNN website, um, doing CNN radio. It was a lot more onerous, it was a lot harder, it was the demands were greater, um, the, the time had to be managed much more effectively. There wasn't a hell of a lot of sort of downtime and um, that's probably part reflects much broadly the, the change in the industry. What it came down to often is, is sacrificing sleep. When you called up with a good story idea, uh, the, the first questions were, when can you have it to us? Number two is, is there any video to it? Is there any picture, is there any photos to it? Uh, what, are, what are the links we're gonna have in it? What are the internet elements? What are the audio visual elements? So it became much more of a multimedia thing. I think overall it's changed things for the better. I've been, um a foreign correspondent for two decades and you know overall I think it's a lot better now writing um, for an internet audience having my email address published you know is, it, it's really um, kind of invigorating and you know I love it that Chinese people read the paper I mean, there are 200 million Chinese who read English and you know they have VPNs we're sometimes blocked sometimes not but um, you know, it raises the stakes, it makes what we do more important. And, you know, we really feel like we're, um, you know, the, the first line of news, not just regurgitating what's in the local press. One prominent Chinese who became adept at using social media to the benefit of reporters was the avant-garde artist Ai Weiwei. Although one of the designers of the famous Olympic Bird's Nest Stadium, he had turned increasingly critical of the government. 
he played the internet like an instrument and he mastered it more than anybody else had and faster than anybody else had. So all of a sudden he was putting out hundreds of photos a week, even before there was a thing like Instagram, a photo sharing service, he was using the internet for that purpose. And he was blogging and he was taking it on in a political way. And he made the internet accessible to people who had previously imagined that it wasn't something for them. Eventually he ended up being detained on tax evasion charges and um, the case went to court. He had a huge public campaign to support him. He ended up paying a fine to the government. But along the way, he was put under house arrest. It's when Ai Weiwei was released from, he'd been in detention 81 days uh, without charge. And when he was released, that story happened on Twitter. You know, he was tweeting, uh, you know, when he, I guess when he got into the car, people who were with him were taking photographs of him when he saw his mother, when he got into his house. And you could track where he was through Twitter. Yet many reporters also came to believe the new technology and increased demands were in some ways impeding coverage of China, making it harder to get away from the wired cities, from breaking news, or to work on stories in remote areas that required being out of touch with the head office. The idea is the wires covered the, the spot news daily, and we were supposed to be on the road traveling, looking for kind of trend stories, looking for the analysis pieces, the big takeouts, really only writing the big, the biggest stories. Um, but we, all of a sudden, you know, we've become a wire service. We used to be able to get on a plane and go to somewhere and spend a week there covering, a, a writing about a story, talking to everybody and coming back and giving the definitive story on this topic. Uh, because of the internet, because of the, uh, the, the competitive demands and the 24 seven news cycle, uh, there's been much more emphasis now on just churning out uh, more spot news and less, uh, and, and less interest in the kind of conventional Washington Post long form front page narrative that I think uh, we did so well in the past. And that had consequences. My feeling is that in telling the story of change in China, there's not enough attention on the lives and choices and challenges of people who live in that massive swathe of China that's not on the eastern coast and nor is it on the western peripheries. So it's that hundreds of millions of people who live in small towns and villages and small cities from, you know, from Hebei through to Qinghai. In response, Barbara Demick of the Los Angeles Times made a conscious decision to leave most of the big political stories to the wires and spend the bulk of her time outside Beijing. What I was good at doing was, you know, picking a story sort of far out off the beaten path and, you know, really pursuing the thread all the way to the end. And I, I've always been, um, I think my strength as a reporter has been in being s sort of inconspicuous, even though I'm not Asian. I have a way of putting on, um, you know, a big hat and flat shoes and dusty clothes. Actually, most of my clothes are dusty and, um, you know, just traipsing around. And, you know, I got into, you know, very remote villages in Guizhou and Hunan doing um, child trafficking stories. I was able to work in Xinjiang, you know, more or less unnoticed. I spent um, a couple of weeks traveling in th Tibetan areas wearing, again, you know, a big floppy hat and a face mask. And, you know, I, I like to, I really like to observe, you know, you know, real life unfiltered by all the commentary in Beijing. Rob Schmitz of Marketplace, who spent his first years in China as a Peace Corps volunteer in a small village, felt the same way. I think that we get a lot of stories about urban China, we don't get enough stories about rural China. And I think that the fate of China largely lies in their hands. And when your first experience in China is in rural China, you learn that a lot of the issues that the Western media talks about a lot, like democracy, censorship of the internet. These are issues that most Lao Bai Sing, most normal Chinese don't care about that much. They're not talking about that around the dinner table when they're talking about problems. They're talking about hukou issues. They're talking about, they feel there's a sense of inequality in the system, in society. They're talking about legal reform, these things. That's what they care about. 
In the winter of 2011, popular uprisings fueled by grievances over inequality, corruption and repression erupted across the Middle East. What became known as the Arab Spring soon had an impact on China. Right after the Arab revolutions had began, um, had begun, we started hearing talk or seeing talk on the Chinese internet of, um, of ideas um, that China should maybe undertake uh, similar types of um, protests. And then messages started appearing on the internet saying, oh, uh, every, people who uh, want uh, political reform or want to protest the system should gather at, on this Sunday afternoon at, uh, the, for example, the shopping street of Wang Fujing, right in central Beijing, and not far from the leadership compound. Tomas Etzler worked for Czech TV and CNN. I took a small camera, I decided to go there, and the scene was very chaotic. And the people were asked on the internet to bring a jasmine flower. When I arrived there, there was already a lot of people there, but it was more, the most of the people who were there were media and police. But then I noticed there were a couple of people who actually put down the flowers, and they were dragged away uh, by the police. For several weekends after, the same scene was repeated. Virtually no demonstrators, lots of journalists, and huge numbers of police who became increasingly aggressive. It showed that the security state was the uh, paranoia within the security state and the fact that they were intent on preventing anything like the Arab revolutions from happening in China. One result was a sharp rise in threats and intimidation aimed at foreign journalists. We started seeing more and more people uh, just getting grabbed. Uh, there were uh, friends of ours who were pulled into an alleyway. Uh, there was there was another uh, woman who I saw get get pulled into a, um, a store, and then I was grabbed as well, along with my colleague. And so we were taken by the arm, and I was physically lifted, um, and eventually uh, dragged into a bank where people were still banking. And uh, um, we were questioned a lot about the footage and told it had to disappear and. Uh, they weren't happy that we had it. There was one Sunday when uh, we showed up at Wang Fujing, when um, journalists showed up at Wang Fujing, and, they, and there were uh, very violent actions by the police against journalists. Uh, one of the people who went there that Sunday was a photographer for the New York Times, Shiho Fukada. And she and another photographer were set upon by police and dragged off into an alleyway and then eventually bundled into cars or vans, I believe. Mm -hmm. But at that same time, a Bloomberg videographer, uh, Steve Engel, had been filming this. And then uh, plainclothes uh, officers um, or thugs working for the police surrounded him, demanded that he stop filming, tried to take his video camera away, and then started beating him right there in the street when he uh, refused to do so. Um, he eventually suffered, I believe, a broken rib. The intimidation went to extremes Western reporters had never before experienced in China. I was uh, in my apartment and uh, um, I got, you know, somebody came to the door and at that time I was living by myself. Um, my husband was, was not around. And um, so I got this, this visit and I, I just uh, went to look in the little monitor um, who was there. And it, were, it was a, a couple of guys who were wearing very dark jackets. And they were also uh, wearing very, you know, I mean, dark sunglasses as well. And that was scary because I didn't know who these people were and they were buzzing at my, my doorbell um, very aggressively and it, it scared me. They would turn up at my house asking my son, our youngest son who was about 10 or 11 at the time, where I was starting to interrogate him. Uh, if my wife a couple of times was at a coffee shop and they were parked outside watching her all the time. So there was there was a definite sense that they crossed the line here. You don't interrogate a child. I mean, you don't. It, that was a harassment. That was an intimidation method. It was a message they wanted to send to, to Stan Grant, and they, they made him very angry. My family and I went to uh, Capital M, a restaurant um, in right near Tiananmen Square, Tianmen, uh, because there was an event for uh, kids, uh, a children's author. Was, had written a book uh, about a rabbit and a rabbit who challenges the Chinese emperor. 
So I take my kids, you know, we're sitting there, and the story is, I mean, it's sort of interesting. You know, it's about a rabbit that's challenged the emperor, and he's mischievous, and he does things that are not good for the emperor. And so we're all sitting there realizing, at least the adults are realizing, this is an interesting metaphor for what's going on, you know, on the other side of, of Tiananmen Square. And I look behind me, and it's, you know, it's a bunch of kids and parents, and there are probably five or six guys with their... You know, the, the crew cut tops, the public security bureau guys who are sitting there and they're trying to figure out what does this mean? what does this kid's story mean? Um, and it made me just realize how ridiculous this is that you know they they've come they've sent dispatched this battalion of public security guys to to come look at an expat kid story. Many reporters believe the government was wildly overreacting. What was interesting to us was that we didn't think anything like the Arab revolutions would take place in China. We knew that the economic conditions in China um, wouldn't push people, large numbers of Chinese, to um, take those risks to um, push back against the party, um, and that the voices calling for this were only a very small minority. So we were very skeptical whether anything like the Jasmine uh, revolution, as envisioned by these mysterious um, dissenters on the internet, would materialize. But the but the party state thought otherwise. American and other foreign reporters now found themselves tailed, harassed, blocked, even beaten on almost a regular basis. The press corps feels constantly hemmed in and sometimes threatened, uh, either physically or professionally, by the authorities. I think the, the, the Arab Spring uprisings mark some, something of a turning point in China and for China's relations with the journalists. I think they, they came to see uh, the journalist as even more of an enemy as, uh, than they did before. I expected to be reported, I expected to be followed, and I feel like even though I didn't keep track of the numbers qualitatively, there was definitely a feeling that we had a small window to do any story before somebody will show up to try to stop us. And that became more the norm. Increasingly, reporting in China felt like, uh, you know, the stories that you hear from war zones where you, you arrive somewhere, you stay 20 minutes and then you move on because people will know that you're there. I mean, you know, increasingly we were having that kind of experience. You'd get to a village, you'd talk to people for 20 minutes, there'd be a knock on the door, the local officials would come and you would get in trouble. There started to be a real element of tradecraft, almost in the spy way, to journalism. You know, when you wanted to go on one of these trips, you really had to plan it out, you know, to fly into another province and then hire a car and then drive and then hire another car with local plates, where to stay so you weren't staying in hotels, how to get places without leaving any kind of trace of where you were. And that was the kind of thing that started to obsess us. While doing a story in Hunan province about lead poisoning, Barbara Demick of the Los Angeles Times was one of many reporters who discovered that in the countryside, ordinary folks were often on their side. The taxi driver was very obliging, and he was also, you know, you know, really on our side. And at one point, um, there was a, an unmarked van following us very close. With um, it was like a mobile telephone company van. They were clearly following us. And uh, the, the taxi driver said, "I'm going to lose these people." So he drove us into a bus station where all the taxis were parked. The taxis there were green. And he called a friend of his and he said, like, get out the back of the taxi, stay very low, and get into my friend's taxi. So there were, you know, there are hundreds of identical green taxis. So um, we got out, um, you know, staying low. We were in the back seat and got into the back seat of the next taxi. You know, and as I was leaving, I said, you know, I want to pay you. And he said, oh, you know, no, no, you don't have to pay. Things became even worse in the spring and summer of 2011, when a series of self-immolations occurred in Tibet and neighboring provinces, ethnic Tibetans protesting what they saw as Chinese repression. And the immolations were at their peak. And it was so difficult to report from Tibetan areas. And the problem really was that Nobody knew what was going on, and nobody had been there, so nobody knew what the level of, you know, the level of harassment was, and intimidation was in those areas. We'd go up into Sichuan province uh, because as a way of trying to get into where uh, 
the heat was really coming down. There'd been a big security presence around those areas up on the, the Tibetan Sichuan border. Uh, the entire part, that entire part of the province was in heavy police lockdown to be able to get our story out. I remember going back to um, the hotel and being tailed in a car. We split up and got into, into different taxis and thought we'd throw them off our scent. We got back to the hotel, we got piled into another vehicle to go to the airport. While we were travelling out to the airport, we were actually rear-ended by a car that smashed into the back of the taxi. Um, we told the taxi driver to just keep driving. We got to the, the airport and they were waiting there at the airport for us again. They actually waited until we tried to check in at the airport and then they, they seized us. The way I operated would always be to try and find the monastery kitchens because they never put cameras in the kitchens and you always have a number of people in the kitchens. And I remember we went to one kitchen and people started talking to us and they said, you must leave. If, you, if they see you here, they'll shoot us. And I thought that I had misheard. And I said, what? And he made this gesture and said, you need to leave, you need to leave now. And I looked in the corner of the room, there was a woman who was chopping and her, she was smiling, but her hands were shaking. As 2011 drew to a close, tensions between the foreign press and the Chinese authorities remained high. Chen Guangcheng, the blind lawyer who challenged abusive practices by Chinese family planning officials, had been confined to his home in a village east of Beijing after being released from prison in 2010. In December 2011, actor Christian Bale, the star of Batman and other movies, set out with CNN's Stan Grant hoping to visit Chen and highlight his plight. He was making a film at the time in China and wanted to meet Chen Guangcheng. He'd been inspired by the stories that he'd seen us, uh, he'd seen us cover. We then travelled there with him and that was a story that really set the whole issue alight because once again we were set upon by the authorities. As you can see they're, they're pushing Christian here. This time they were beating up a, a world-renowned actor, um, an Oscar winner, someone you know known to America whose celebrity really magnified this story and broke this story through to a much bigger audience. Beijing increasingly began to threaten reporters that their journalist visas would not be renewed. By now, the Christian Science Monitor's Peter Ford was president of the Foreign Correspondence Club of China. The Chinese authorities are trying to influence foreign coverage of China by threatening to withhold visas. And that is a violation of their undertakings. Uh, it's a violation of international procedure. It's a violation of everything. And the Chinese don't care. We got to the situation where my, my visa had to be renewed uh, and we got down to the last day. This was the time when I was trying to with, withhold visas, trying not to approve visas. For me, it came down to the very last day. I was either going to get it approved or I have to leave the country. Um, they'd been refusing and refusing and refusing to, to uh, approve my visa until the very, very last minute, again, to make this statement that they weren't happy about us. There was a real sense there that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had lost the, the power battle with the, with the, the PSB, the security Bureau that this was now being run by the thugs. I knew I was in trouble when they, at the end of 2011, going into 2012, they didn't give me a one-year visa. They gave me a two-month visa. Um, and I do not believe that had happened for some time or had ever happened as a strategy. So they were keeping me on a very, very tight leash. One story where the government couldn't prevent coverage was the environment. The country's atrocious pollution was something reporters lived with every day. There's no other way to put it. It's China's being poisoned by its industrial growth. It became a, a big story because the whole press corps and most of the press corps in Beijing, you don't have to go too far to, to find the story. It's right out your window. The U.S. Embassy in Beijing had started putting out hourly air quality measurements on its Twitter feed. Chinese diplomats approached the U.S. Embassy and told them to shut down their air monitor because it would cause social instability in China. I think I did some of the first stories, maybe the first story, about the U.S. Embassy's air quality monitor. 
and you know how it had gotten um, you know a lot of people paying attention and looking at the numbers. I mean that was one of the better things the U.S. Embassy did in Beijing because by publishing the air quality numbers, um, they really got people to pay attention, both foreigners and Chinese. And I think that was, you know, for for the good. People were aware aware of how bad it was and, and, and wanted the government to do something about it. And you're seeing that all across the country where um, people don't want to have chemical factories built close to them, or they don't want to deal anymore with um, hazardous environment uh, where they are um, literally you know, cleaning, recycling with their bare hands. They don't want to have to live um, live with the, 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 the pollution and the um, polluted soil or polluted water. I think the single story I've written from China that's gotten the most reaction among readers is a first person piece I did that year about um, living in China with a baby daughter and sort of the um, tough choices um, and the guilt that I felt about um, having her stay in China with me and sort of, um, you know, putting out there the question of like, should I stay um, because of my own personal interest in China or, or would it be better for her to leave? And I think this is a question that a lot of Chinese who have that option of leaving are asking themselves now. The pollution um, is, is something that's very difficult to deal with. And it, just for, for me personally, of course, it's, it's difficult to deal with because you are constantly in situations where you or your colleagues are feeling like you have to wear a mask all the time or you're checking to see what, what the air rating is. And there's been a, an exodus of foreign journalists uh, and foreign business people from, from Beijing, certainly to Shanghai, which is where I've now moved. I mean, I'm part of this, you know, I'm a pollution refugee as well. Pollution repression, corruption. The grimmest aspects of China tended to dominate the coverage, overshadowing the country's amazing economic progress. But sometimes things went too far. In January of 2012, a report aired on public radio's This American Life about alleged abuses at a factory run by the Taiwanese company Foxconn that made iPhones and other Apple products in the southern city of Shenzhen. Foxconn was a controversial company. It had been dogged by claims of poor working conditions, and several workers had committed suicide. Eunice Yoon was one of many journalists who'd looked into the issue and discovered that the story was more complex. When we spoke to the people at, at, at Foxconn, it was uh, a lot of people had, had said that, that they thought that they were pretty good and that generally well-paying jobs and that the conditions were okay. The report about Foxconn for This American Life was done by American storyteller and entertainer Mike Daisy. When I first heard about uh, Mike Daisy's story, it just, it sounded so outlandish. Rob Schmitz of Marketplace had a similar it, reaction. I immediately thought that it didn't sound right. Um, the way he was portraying the city in these grand majestic tones and um, talking about this factory that had guards who were carrying guns. And when some of these things were, were uttered on, on, on the air, I thought, oh, okay, maybe this is a, you know, exaggerated or fictionalized account of a trip uh, to Shenzhen. But later on in the broadcast, the, the host, Ira Glass, says that they had fact-checked this. Schmitz tracked down Daisy's translator, a woman called Kathy. It was clear that uh, when we got to the point where I was asking her about what she and Mike had saw, that she was very uncomfortable with what he, how he had portrayed the trip. And when I went to go and visit her in Shenzhen, she made it clear that these things did not happen. Schmitz contacted This American Life and, in collaboration with the program, did a piece revealing that much of Daisy's account was not true. In an unprecedented step, the program's host, the highly respected Ira Glass, retracted the original story. And the most powerful and memorable moments in the story all seem to be fabricated. After it aired, um, there were hundreds of, of emails that were sent my way and to, the, to This American Life's way about the, about the program. Uh, most of them uh, praised the retraction, um, praised the work that, that we had done. Um, there were also emails, and I would say it would probably be a quarter maybe uh, of, of the emails, 
um, that were written saying, this can't be right. The translator must have lied to you. She lives in this terrible communist country. They would have hurt her if she would have told the truth that Mike Daisy was telling. It was a sobering example of how stereotypes of conditions in China had seeped into mainstream American consciousness, underscoring the challenges facing reporters trying to convey the many shades of a complex, rapidly changing society. I should say, I am not happy to have to come to you and tell you that something that we presented on the radio as factual is not factual. All of us in public radio stand together. And I have friends and colleagues on lots of other shows who, like us here at This American Life, work hard to do accurate, independent reporting week in, week out. I and my coworkers here at This American Life, we are not happy to have done anything to hurt the reputation of the journalism that happens on this radio station every day. So we want to be completely transparent about what we got wrong and what we now believe is the truth.